Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of The Search. Thank you all for listening in. Uh, today's episode, I'd like to talk about whole body CT scanning or PAN scans as they're known. Um, throughout my infinitely short surgical career, and medical career for that matter, come to think of it, um, I've been to various conferences and I've heard people talk a lot of rhetoric and present very little data to prove that PAN scans are a bad thing. I've heard everything from the studies are being driven by radiologists who want to make more money to that the radiation risk will lead to major lawsuits and a class action suit in 10 years against me, up to and including the fact that they delay trauma care and they delay definitive care. And um, hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll prove that there's very little data to support that and that although you shouldn't be scanning every single person under the sun, a happy medium does exist and we should try and reach it moving forward. So, disclaimer, I am a surgeon. We have been known to be a little bit impatient in the trauma room, um, but I'm also a traumatologist. And I try my best to stay unbiased when it comes to these things and welcome arguments for and against anything that I say online. Um, you all know how to contact me either through the YouTube comments or through uh, Twitter or uh, via my email. Eventually, I'll get a website up and running, but um, more than happy to listen to any comments, good or bad, and any criticisms, good or bad. So when I first started reading about whole body CT scanning and PAN scans, we had lots of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and the results tended to show a trend, quote-unquote, towards uh, mortality benefit, but no definitive data to support it, and uh, no statistically significant data to support it. There was also a trend to shorter stay in the ED and faster final disposition, but no data to support that either. And then we had even more meta-analyses and retrospective studies, and the same thing happened again. Having looked at the fine print on these studies and tried to come up with my own opinion, not based on the conclusion or the discussion in each study, I've noticed a couple of things. First, a lot of studies tend to group hemodynamically unstable and hemodynamically stable patients together. From a traumatologist's perspective, if somebody's hemodynamically unstable, they shouldn't go to CT scan. They should go to someplace else, either the angiography suite or the OR for diagnostic peritoneal lavage or something of that nature, or a fast ultrasound to confirm that there's no bleeding and two chest tubes to confirm that there's no bleeding and then we move forward. But to take somebody to a CT scanner and hemodynamic instability as your knee-jerk response, it's just not cricket. It's not the right thing to do for a patient, at least in my humble opinion. The caveat to that is if you have an isolated head injury, but that's not the topic for today. The second thing I've noticed is that a lot of them tend to not differentiate between blunt and penetrating trauma. And I think the utility of PAN scans from this body of literature tends to support its use in blunt trauma as opposed to penetrating. The third thing I noticed was that we the outcomes that we're looking for are outcomes that are unrealistic in retrospective studies and trauma. We try to figure out mortality benefit or lack thereof. We try to figure out intention to treat analysis or lack thereof. And we try to figure out never events that shouldn't be happening in the first place, like the development of radiation and how much radiation they're exposed to. And uh, moving forward, uh, within the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm hoping to convince you that the data on radiation in and of itself is not all that great when it comes to radiology. It's not quite the same with radiation oncology, but when it comes to radiology, the data isn't there yet. And I emphasize on the word yet. I still have hope. So that's argument one for against PAN scans, that the meta-analyses don't make sense. Yes, they do. They tell us that they work for blunt traumas. They tell us that they don't work for hemodynamically unstable patients. And they tell us that we need to figure out what our criteria are and be more consistent with them, and that we need a randomized controlled trial. So you do exactly what a retrospective meta-analysis and systematic review are supposed to do. They lay down the groundwork for your prospective trial. The second argument I hear is that the yield from a scan without any clinical signs is fairly low. The studies that say this either group old and new scans together from circa 1990 and 2007 and 2005 and 2015, or they're fairly small studies. And the two that I've mentioned, not to pick out any names, are both studies that tend to do that and tend to have that error. And to illustrate the point, this study by uh, Molina et al. in 2007 um, 
seem to prove that CT scans that were done in that era using the trauma protocols that were used in that era, using the conventional CT scanners that were available on a perimortem slash postmortem uh, event. Um, I don't know why they took patients that, that were perimortem to CT scan, but whatever. Were very had a very low uh, uh, yield overall. And the reason why I illustrate this point is to say, making the argument that clinical acumen is better than uh, CT scanning or clinical acumen should trigger selective CT scanning as opposed to the history should trigger or lack thereof should trigger pan scanning or whole body CT scanning. It's kind of like saying, because the iPhone 1 took a long time to send an email, the BlackBerry is better today. It makes no sense to me. The, the difference between the iPhone 1 and the iPhone 7 is the difference between the CT scans that they're comparing and the CT scans that we do today in the trauma bay. So that data, again, argument number two, clearly out the way. Argument number three centers around the REACT2 trial, the first randomized control trial to try and figure out whether total body CT scanning versus selective CT scanning makes a difference to mortality, hospital stay, radiation exposure. And they found that makes no difference whatsoever. But this is based on their group randomized data. If you look at the fine print, of those who were supposed to undergo standard workup and selective CT scanning, 46%, that's just about half, ended up getting PAN scans anyway and ended up getting total body CT scans anyway. That means that in 46% of cases that should have gone for selective CT scanning, they ended up actually getting whole body CT scans after they were reassessed during their stay in the trauma in the trauma room or in the ED facility. So it's really like a hats off to them for giving it a good try, but the data isn't there yet. And so therefore I would contend that PAN scans do not delay patient care. PAN scans are not going to subject your patients uh, to over investigation in any way. And PAN scans are not a result of surgeons being surgeons and radiologists wanting money. There is no economic driver here. PAN scans, in my humble opinion, have yet to show any benefit, but have also yet to show any harm. And the reason why is because the data isn't there yet, and we're asking the wrong question, in my opinion. And it's very hard for me, given how junior I am in my career and how immature my career is right now, to come up with a clear-cut answer to this. But I have to say that apart from saying that may possibly lead to shorter stay in the ED, maybe high yield for findings that you would treat otherwise, and are useful in hemodynamically stable blunt traumas with a significant energy burden or unwitnessed uh, traumas, the current data is actually loose stool water, for lack of a better term. It's complete poop. We don't have the data to say that it's a bad idea to take somebody to a CT scan if they're hemodynamically stable and were hit by a truck. The data isn't there yet. We don't have data to say that if we have a negative fast and we have a negative abdominal exam, we don't need to scan the belly. And we certainly don't have data to say that somebody with four rib fractures, no hemothorax and no pneumothorax, does not have an aortic dissection if they were on a motorbike 50 minutes earlier. So whenever I hear that CTs at the chest are low yield, that PAN scans are just making doctors dumber and dumber, or that they're bad habits or expose patients to more radiation, my argument against that is, if you miss an aortic dissection, it's game over. If you miss a vertebral artery dissection, a base of skull fracture, your patient who's 26 years old will stroke out. And if you really want to look at the data, patients aren't spending longer in your emergency room, patients are getting exposed to cancer, and patients aren't getting exposed to anything else as a result of getting a whole body CT scan if you pick out the right patient for it. And the reason why I think the data is lacking is because there are so many variables involved. Take a look at your typical admission. First, the ED talk has to take a look at them. Then they have to activate the trauma team, and the trauma team leader has to come down. This is obviously in a level one trauma center. Then you have to assess the quality of your scanner and make sure that it's consistent with everybody else and all the other studies that are being done in 2017. Then you have to assess your radiographer, make sure that the quality of the scan, the orientation of the cuts, the phasing is correct and consistent with your hospital protocol that you've agreed upon with the radiologists. And then your scan is only as good as the radiologist who's reading it. Yes, a lot of us can read CT scans. I myself can read them quite well and have very good confidence in, uh, in my decisions based on my own read of a CT scan 
But ultimately, your radiologist plays a far more significant role in the food chain, especially in 2017 in the management of hemodynamically stable traumas with solid organ injuries. And then all this has to be fed back to the trauma team leader. Bear in mind that all of this has to happen during a dynamic resuscitation of a patient where the outcome is time sensitive. Any delay in diagnosis will lead to mortality, whether it's a chest trauma, whether it's a solid organ injury, or whether it's a vascular dissection in the neck. A delay in diagnosis will translate to a difference in mortality. That golden hour still exists in 2017, despite all the advances that we've made. So the reality is, with such a short amount of time to make a decision and with very little data telling you not to make that decision, it's very hard for me not to offer my patients a pan scan, especially when I don't have a history, I have a diminished GCS and I have a high mechanism of injury. You can all see where this is going. The other problem I have is that the literature does not support a consistency in terms of pan scan protocols. Take a look at the Swiss study. All over Switzerland, different pan scan protocols exist. And different radiology protocols exist, and different definitions of PAN scans exist. So it's very hard for me to say that whole body CT scanning is the wrong thing or the right thing if not all whole body CT scans are equal. Similar data has been found in the NHS in Britain and uh, in uh, all across the US in different hospital systems, especially exclusive ones. There are even PAN scans or PAN scan advocates that have tried to figure out whether or not um, contrast is actually required. And the fact of the matter is that as a given, for chest and abdomen, contrast is required, as this study clearly illustrates out of France. It's very hard for me to make an argument that the data out there is valid if I have three different areas and three different areas within one continent advocating for different PAN scans for different reasons that are not supported by the literature yet. You have 31 different flavors of PAN scans. You have just as many as you have Baskin Robbins, literally. Go look it up yourselves. Look up whole body CT scanning protocol online and see how many different variations you have. But the one that I found supported the most and the ones that I found most consistent with the least amount of radiation exposure have been the following. And I call this my dream protocol, which I will one day apply in my hospital once I've given, been given enough control to do it. A CT head before you give any contrast because it increases the yield for intraparenchymal bleeds. A CTC spine without contrast as well to look for any bony abnormalities. And a CT angio chest extending from C7 just above the thoracic inlet all the way down to L1, L2 so that you get a bonus CT angio of the kidneys for very minimal increase in radiation in the exact same contrast load. In addition to that, if you have a vertebral injury or if you have a base of skull injury or any other injury that's consistent with Biffle's criteria, such as a complex facial fracture, you may want to include everything from C1 down during that CT angio of the chest. Lastly, I'd add a portal venous phase from T11 to the mid thigh because you're getting the bonus of looking for any extension of pelvic fractures into the groin and acetabular area and you're getting reconstructions of the TNL spine as a bonus. In addition to that, the portovenous phase has been the phase that has been shown uh, to be the most sensitive and specific for grading of organ injury, though not necessarily for showing an active blush. If there's a delayed, if there's a question of a bladder injury or a weird looking pelvic fracture, and this does happen from time to time, albeit very rarely, or if you have hematuria in your Foley catheter that you've inserted in the trauma bay, then you may want to consider adding um, a delayed phase to look at the bladder, sort of a CT cysto with the, uh, the Foley catheter clamped. And uh, I've used this protocol before in various centers, and I found it to be the least amount of radiation, the quickest to do, and the easiest for a radiographer to interpret. And I, I mean that wholeheartedly. If you tell a radiology tech this protocol, ad lib, I'd say 95% of the time they'll know exactly what you're talking about. If you tell them you want to pan scan, they'll scratch their heads, particularly in institutions that don't deal with trauma regularly. So I, I, I take the slide home with me personally. So argument number four is radiation. So what's up with the radiation? Does it exist? Does it exist? The answer is yes, it does exist. Yes, we are subjecting patients to radiation. But the risk of the radiation has varied between 0.1 and 0.3% as bare radiation risk.com. And that risk of radiation, once calculated, although it is mildly higher than selective CT scanning groups, especially in the REACT 2 trial, there's no data to tell me, hand on heart, that radiation of this nature 
causes cancer. The data that we have is extrapolated from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it doesn't make sense to me that we're using that data to say that we shouldn't be doing whole body CT scans on patients that may die of an injury that we've missed. So there is no outcome data for radiation exposure, and there hasn't been a single lawsuit that says that, or a single lawsuit that has been won based on radiology screening or radiology tests. There have been some lawsuits that were performed by workers in radiology. There have been some lawsuits that have been won by patients <clears throat> who have been subjected to radiotherapy. They may have been suboptimal. But there hasn't been a single lawsuit based on a CT scan or overscanning. Still, the question becomes how to overscan, uh, how to avoid overscanning more aptly. And uh, the best way I can think of doing that is to come up with indications that make sense. And to this day, not a single body within... Not a single body or association in trauma or involved in the business and practice of trauma or emergency medicine has come up and said, this is our consensus guideline. This is what we think. Or this is our evidence-based guideline and this is what we think, despite the lack of evidence. It's not like upper GI bleeds. There hasn't been a single consistent scoring system or factor identified, but there have been various different attempts with varied levels of success and some of them have been validated, such as the nexus criteria, for example. What I found for whole body CT scans when looking online, looking at various reviews, is that if you have a significant burden of energy transfer, if you have a relatively low GCS, if you have multiple regions of the body involved, if it's an unseen or un unwitnessed trauma, or if there's hemodynamic instability, strike that, because if you're hemodynamically unstable, you shouldn't be going to the CT scanner, in my opinion. If you have extremes of age and frailty that have been proven to have delayed diagnoses, of injuries and trauma that may be treatable, then you should be pan scanning them. And and that's sort of a, a sort of non-evidence-based review of the literature in general. Whether you take that to be your activation criteria or not is your prerogative. There is another benefit to pan scanning that I haven't mentioned, and this is apart from picking out injuries that you may want to treat before your patient leaves the ED, and this is the fact that some patients come back with incidental findings, especially in final reports. And um, a post hoc analysis of the REACT-2 trial sort of proves the point because you had almost double the yield of confirmed neoplasms in patients who'd come in for trauma. That means you had about a 6% chance of having a suspected cancer and a 5% chance of having a confirmed cancer when you walked into the emergency room after a trauma and required a pan scan. So that to me says that it shouldn't be the reason why we do pan scans, but we shouldn't feel so guilty about doing them because every now and then you might catch something in time. You might catch something because it, that may influence your patient's mortality even further than the actual trauma itself. So in summary, I don't think that we need more meta-analyses. I don't think we need more systematic reviews and you can say that you might want some clean, true-to-life retrospectives, but in trauma, that's very hard to do. The reality is that you have to just accept that sometimes you need to pass scan people to save lives. You need to figure out who you're going to pass scan and how you're going to pass scan them in your institution earlier than the day that the patient's coming in. There are too many variables involved, and there's too little time involved in making decisions to treat these patients. If you're going to pan scan people, keep an eye out for incidental findings that may change their outcome 10 to 15 months down the line, 10 to 15 years down the line. Radiation risk and trauma is an afterthought. There's no good data to support the fact that pan scanning in trauma, this one event that occurs in a patient's lifetime, this one car accident that's going to happen every 10 to 15 years, is going to make a huge difference. Whereas you picking up an aortic dissection, as mentioned prior, will. And that's just my two cents. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast and um, I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. Uh, if this was remotely interesting or helpful, be sure to check out our YouTube, Twitter, Android, or RSS feed and subscribe accordingly. Um, also on Twitter and will soon be on Instagram, though in um, what capacity, I'm not sure yet. Thank you for listening in, and this is Saud Al-Zaid signing off, I guess.